5 p.m. First item on the agenda is a view of minutes for October 6, 2020. Is there a motion for approval? I make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Next item is a conflict of interest disclosure by any board member. Does any board member have a conflict of interest? Just me and you all are here, so. Nope. No? Nope. Okay. Next item is public comments on agenda items. Does anyone have a comment to make? Okay, we'll move on. Next item is the finance committee. Quarter report, Mr. Charlie Brown. Well, thank you. Um, I have a couple of uh, announcements to make, first of all. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, as you as you know, my uh, trusted assistant and uh, and partner over the la over the years has been Teresa, my lovely wife, and she has been named the director of the animal shelter here. And unfortunately, she's spending most of her time saving lives instead of dealing with with uh, fixed income bonds and and my business. So, I had uh, decided to take on a partner. And there's. Um, a guy that works with our firm that I've known for some time, and he and I have, his name is Jared Patterson, and he and I have shared uh, some accounts, and and he has shares a similar philosophy from an investing standpoint and has the tremendous experience in, in fixed income over the years. Uh, please don't hold it against him, but he is a graduate from uh, University of Texas at Arlington. And he does have his degree in finance. So we've worked together for a while, and and I thought he could uh, he could add uh, a lot to uh, helping me work with these accounts that you know Teresa used to do a lot of the a lot of the work for. Jared's on the line, so Jared, why don't you just say hello to everybody? Uh, yes, hello, Charlie. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I consider myself fortunate to work with someone knowledgeable and experienced in the fixed income markets is Charlie. Uh, I look forward to working with the Hector County Hospital District and a good long relationship in conjunction with Charlie. Uh, I, I should mention that uh, Nancy Mahler, she's a very smart young lady that works in my office and she helps in handling administrative details which uh, frees up my time to be able to to uh, travel with Charlie and, and meet with clients and assist them in making prudent investment decisions. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks. We uh, uh, we talked to Steve Ewing about this and possibly uh, if we can work it out, we'd like to come to the December 1st meeting just so we can have a meet and a greet and, and everybody can see that he's a real person. So if, if, if that's okay, the other, um, does anybody have any questions about that? It it, it strengthens the uh, our position is in terms of of working with the account. The other issue is uh, Finra, the financial industry's regulatory authority, is putting more and more pressure on firms uh, for uh, what they consider consolidated reports. And a consolidated report is basically when you include more than uh, one account and you have to manually input the information. They felt there was a lot of uh, areas that uh, um, could be uh, uh, could be compromising with uh, people just putting in their own numbers. So what they're getting close to, they haven't done it yet, but we're trying to get ahead of the curve, is they're going to We lost you. Anybody there? I'm 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 still here. This is Jared. I'll go ahead and send uh, Charlie a, an email and let him know that uh, the call dropped. Nothing like throwing you in the frying pan, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Uh,
Hello? There you go. I swear I don't know what happened. I didn't touch the telephone. I didn't move it. And I sure as heck didn't hang up on you. So, <laughs> so with DK, can somebody tell me where I was? Where did I leave off? Because <laughs> I don't know when I got cut off. You were wrapping up your presentation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're trying to get rid of me. All right, I'll just make it quick then. At any rate, the uh, if you notice, the report has a, a little different look to it, but it does have the all the same information, and the information that we use to put together um, the, the overheads that you should have up now. Um, one thing I want to mention is and a lot of people want to know where interest rates going to go. And the Fed guidance, they've already told us that um, until unemployment gets to an acceptable level and inflation averages 2% for uh, over a period of time, which may take a few years, that they're going to maintain interest rates where they are. Um, you know, the, the inflation rate now is running about one4 but in the GDP was up 30% last quarter, but it's going to have to show some sustained uh, increases. As you know, the Fed meddles with our interest rates a lot, and, and I think clear my feelings, a lot of it they shouldn't meddle with, but they do. The U.S. economy or the U.S. bonds are still a favored bond uh, for a lot of institutional investors, even though the last, I think, uh, see the last six month uh, treasury bill we bought was at 0.10%, which is as low as I've ever seen in, in, in my stint in the business. But uh, they, may, they plan on maintaining a lower interest rate and lower Fed funds rate. Now, you keep in mind internationally, the German two year. If you invest in Germany in German government bonds, which is like our treasury notes, for two years you get a minus 0.8%. For five years it's a minus 0.81. Then if you go out 10 years, you get a minus 0.62. And how about this? If you invest your money for 30 years, you get a minus 0.22%. So you have to pay almost a quarter of a percent for them to take your money and put it in government bonds. So as, as far as that goes, we're still, even though they're low rates and we don't like them, it's something we're going to have to live with for some time. Um, if you look at the, the screen that has the yield summary on it, you can see that the total, uh, the average yield for all the accounts, we, all the bonds that we had that were 1% or above have all matured or been called. And we might be stuck at this level, but at least it's positive for some time. Um, as you can see, the gain and loss, the unrealized gain and loss is $24,000. If you look at the difference, if you look at the, the next slide, which is the, the yield curve, you can see the difference between where yields are right now and where they were. And they've come down over the last year a bunch. Um, remember, we were getting over a percent, percent and a half last year while we were investing in them. The portfolio main, still, um, we maintain a relatively short uh, duration on the bonds because, frankly, you know, you don't get that much if you go out. As a matter of fact, you get less in a lot of cases if you go out five or ten years. And I don't know that we want, especially in these these trying times of COVID and everything, that we want to be uh, committed to long-term investments in that area. And Steve and I have talked about it a while. And, and so now as things are coming due, we're investing them basically out three to six months. Uh, does anybody have any questions? That's basically it. Anyone have any questions? Well, I was concerned you all still there. You're not sleeping, are you? I know. Hey, Charlie, where you left off when we dropped you was you were talking about coming out here in December. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, 
if it's okay, uh, and if Jared and I can work out the travel arrangements, uh, we'd like to come up maybe for that board meeting just for a meet and greet. We can give you a, a short rundown of what's going on in the marketplace because it will be after the election by that time. If uh, if that's okay with everybody. I think it'd be great. December 1st. Okay. Well, we'll we'll try to make it happen, and I think that you all are going to. I think bringing J, uh, Jared on has been uh, a big help to me. Um, he, he's a hell, 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 heck of a lot younger than I am, and uh, he doesn't have to have surgery. I th hopefully, I'm done with all my surgeries now, though, so I can uh, concentrate on on business at hand. Does anybody have any questions for me or for Jared? Thank you, Charlie. All right, thank you. And uh, happy election day, folks. <laughs> thank you, Goodbye. everybody. Bye. Bye. We need to have a vote on that to prove that. I make a motion that we accept the report. A motion and second, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next item is the uh, quarterly investment officer certification, Steve. Yes, you should have that form in front of you. Uh, basically, yeah. just telling you that uh, as several of these uh, securities were uh, mature during the last quarter, we rolled them over into another security uh, short term, as Charlie mentioned in his presentation. Uh, we are keeping everything in a uh, in a security so it does not show up on our income statement as cash, but as a security. Notice from from if you'll recall from his presentation, there's $51 million worth of investments. We've been trying to keep our investments uh, in that area and not touch that cash during this time period. So uh, if we should ever have to start going into our investments, um, I will inform the board. But at this point, uh, as you'll see later in the presentation, we still have a good uh, day's cash on hand uh, number at this point. We have a motion for approval. I'll make a motion to approve the report. Second. A motion to second. Any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next, we have a consent agenda. Consider approval of the CBA advertising and marketing contract renewal. Consider approval of uh, electric, no, whoa, electric. Yeah, secure view contract renewal. And consider approval of Sophie pricing uh, agreement renewal. Here, here, motion for approval. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor say aye. You know, I guess we better let Steve do his stuff now. <laughs> I'll make it quick. All right, so uh, what we're looking at here in our in our presentation tonight is the end of year results. Uh, so this will be a full 12 months. So it's a, it's a good time to see how we finish this year versus the prior year uh, and versus budget, though I will tell you uh, since we went into COVID back in March, um, I've been more concerned with prior year than budget, simply because uh, our budget uh, had lots of growth built into it, and we're just still trying to uh, recover to prior year. So as you can see, we're at 1,032 admissions for the month. That's a 6% decline from the prior year. On a year-to-date basis, we're at 12,888 admissions. That's an 8.6% decline. This set of numbers here called annualized should match our year to date simply because we're, we're, we're trued up to the end of the year. So I'm only going to speak to month and year to date on, on the rest of the slides. Our adjusted admissions, which take in uh, outpatient 1910, uh, we're off 13 and a half month. You can see we've been significantly below budget and prior year um, all all during this time period 
on a year-to-date basis, we're 10% off of prior years. So overall, we're looking at uh, uh, total hospital adjusted admissions 10% off of last year. That's a significant decline. And when we look at our average daily census, we're at 163 for the month. That's only slightly off of prior year, and that's due to the fact that our length of stay for our patients that are in the, in the hospital is about a quarter of a day higher than what it was this time last year. And so even though we're down in admissions, our, our census is up. Deliveries, if you recall this time last year, you can see we were 205, 209, 204. This started the period in which uh, our deliveries were above the 200 mark. Uh, this month we're at 178, but we'll still finish the year strong at 2,134 deliveries. That puts us 4% uh, over last year, and you can see last year we were at 2,047, so we continue to have a very strong growth in our delivery. Overall surgical cases, uh, 749 for the month of September. If, we're, if we recall, we sort of paused a little bit in August. September came in at 749. We're still 8% off of prior year. On a year-to-date basis, we're 20% off of prior year. But I'll point you to the fact that if we go back and just look at the last six months of this year versus the last six months of last year, um, what COVID has done to our surgical volumes, uh, we run the numbers there, we're 33% off of prior year numbers. So, even though we're 20% on a year-to-date basis, the last half of the year, we were 33% off. And that's a significant decline uh, that we're still, we're still fighting to uh, overcome. Emergency room visits is another one. Uh, we're 25% off. Yes, these visits right here are more higher acuity, uh, but we're still trending um, right at 40,000 ER visits, you can see. Uh, last year, our budget was in the 55, our prior year was at 54, so a significant decline in our ER volumes also. Total outpatient occasions of service, 20,212, 17% off of prior year, year to date 11%, so another, another one. I mean, we've been maintaining about the same difference uh, for the last several months to prior year. Urgent care, uh, this was a little bit surprising, and I think it's simply due to the, uh, the bump we had uh, this year versus the decline when we were without several providers on our urgent care. Uh, we're gonna finish the year only 1% off of, off of prior year. Total ProCare visits, 12% for the month, 11.8 for the year to date. That's in line with uh, all of our hospital visits. When we look at staffing, we've been able to adjust uh, for the month. We're 9.8% off of where we were this time last year, 1,773 FTEs. On a year-to-date basis, we're 5.8% off, which is good. When you look at our paid hours per adjusted patient day, which is a metric on productivity, uh, we're 4.8% less, which is good. We want to be less than prior year. Uh, year to date, we're at 28.6. So you can see uh, we were able to manage our FTEs very well in the month of September. Uh, cash receipts, we're right at the $20 million mark. If you look for the last four months, we've been averaging right at $20 million, which is about where uh, we're settling in. Um, when we look at our total gross receivables, this is days outstanding and gross receivables. You can see we've had a pretty significant decline from August. This is uh, some work that RevWork has been able to do to get our AR turned back into the right direction. We had several conversations. We have a very detailed action plan that they have promised to deliver over the next six months that should get our AR back to where uh, we were expecting it to be. Uh, I have weekly updates from them, and uh, they're, they're progressing as currently projected. So uh, we are 
we are moving. We haven't, you don't have all the things that I'd like to have fixed, but we're moving in the right direction as opposed to the wrong direction, which is what these previous bars were suggesting. Total revenue, um, I'll tell you that our gross charges, this is a, a chart of gross charges, we're only off 4.7% for our year. Uh, so in addition to a little bit longer length of stay, the acuity of our patients is, is higher. So it's, it's not reflected in the same 10% off in volumes that we've seen on a year-to-date basis. We're 9% off, uh, $1.2 billion in billings. When we look at net patient revenues, uh, this is a big number. Uh, but we have several things that are in this number right here, $30 million. Uh, it's showing a 23% or 30% increase over prior year. Um, the last several months, uh, we have been hesitant to, to uh, book certain contractuals uh, so that uh, we wanted to make sure that we were booking uh, according to what we're receiving cash-wise as we work with the outside audit firm to ensure that we won't have a huge contractual hit like we did last year. Um, we were conservative, but we were able to come back and validate that we can pick up about $3 million worth of, of, of contractuals that we previously had expensed. So that, that helps our number there. Um, and so our net patient revenues aren't up as much as it's suggesting. Uh, we have a year-to-date adjustment. When you look at other revenue, you can see we're, we're still fairly strong here. We get into our operating expenses, you can see we're down 7% for prior year on salary, wages, and contract labor. So we continue to manage that to our volumes. Our employee benefits are down. On a year-to-date basis, you can see we're down over $7 million. And that's a function of where we are with our um, expense reductions that we've, we've done with uh, employee management, plus also uh, less uh, health insurance claims. Supply expense is comparable to prior year, but as you can see from on a year-to-date basis, we're, we're down $4 million, which is a nice savings. Purchase services are down almost $5 million to prior year. Uh, we did have a pickup um, when we did a reconciliation with our Cerner uh, invoices. So we aren't trending at 2.5, but we did have a nice pickup in expenses there. Total operating expenses at 26.6 million. So when we look at our operating cash flow for the month, it's $10 million, which is a very nice number, but it's, <coughs> it's not normal recurring um, profitability, this is catch up on certain things that we did, but nevertheless, it's operating profit that we made. Uh, when we look at our year to date, uh, this is good to announce that this time last year, we were at a loss of $4.6 million, we're at 2.9. Now, a good chunk of this improvement year over year is the additional uh, Medicaid supplemental payments that we've received, uh, part of from COVID, part of just how the program has worked. Uh, this, this increase or this improvement does not include the CARES grant money. We're showing that as a non-operating cash flow. So in addition to overall operations um, looking like an improvement, uh, we have CARES grant funding. Now, if I back all that out, we, we, we back out the CARES grant, and we back out the additional Medicaid supplemental funding on the operating revenues that we lost, we have a $40 million loss for the, for the hospital for the year. But because of additional Medicaid funding, uh, we were able to capture some of that uh, because of the expense reductions that we did starting in the uh, April, May time period we were able to counter some of those lost um, revenues. So um, I'd love to tell you this is a great number. We've, we've, we've done this, but when we look at how we got there, there was a lot of special help. 
So we're not out of the woods is probably the, the message I want to get across to the board. Can you say expression of the divine intervention? Well, I'll call it that to, to whatever you want to say. Uh, it's just good we've got some extra monies that came in, plus the hard work we did in trying to manage our expenses during this last six months. When I look at our day's cash on hand, as I've told the board, we are trying to pay down uh, on our, uh, we had stretched our payables out simply because we didn't know where we were going to be uh, with, um, with COVID. Uh, as you heard earlier, we have $51 million in investments. If we break it down, we have 101 days worth of cash. Let's just say 51 days is investment. Another 50 is what I call normal operating uh, cash that we're using. Um, so we're, we're well positioned to go into the upcoming flu season, not knowing what we've, we've got um, in front of us. I mean, we're as, as so I was looking at numbers, we're back up to 51 patients in house. So we just we just don't know where things are going to be and how that's going to impact our surgery. So it's good to have 50 days worth of operating cash plus 51 days in the in the bank as far as investments. I will tell you, I have excluded from this number the $30 million that we got from the Medicare advance payments. Remember, we got those funds in August. We've got those segregated over in Frost Bank. We have to pay those monies back starting next August. So the plan is they stay in the bank and they're the final, final defense of anything if the bottom should truly fall out. But at this point, we're sitting with 100 days worth of cash uh, between our normal savings and what we've got in our operating account. So, uh, for all intent and purposes, we're just going to keep that and, and let it collect the 0.1% interest that it's going to collect and then hope that uh, the government makes some kind of decision on how we pay it back. Right now it's 18 months, so it'll be in the bank for a long period of time. But that gives us plenty of cushion. Is there still talk of uh, forgiving that? There may be, but we don't know. It's all come to a, 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 a grinding halt. And it will just really depend on what happens with the election today, and what comes in the next stimulus package. Um, it already moved once. It was going to be yeah. due in January. Yeah. yeah. They bounced it to August for testing. Yeah. That's a good sign. But we'll see what happens after that. Yeah. So it's good that we were able to get the, the monies uh, there for about uh, two months, almost three. They had frozen it. So, you know, those that asked for it really early got it. Those of us that asked for a little bit later because we were thinking it was a four month window and we had to start paying it back. We were sort of sitting on a bubble for a while, but we finally got it uh, approved and, and funded in August. So um, it's out there. Um, I've also got emails from Frost Bank in which they're wanting us to uh, move forward with the line of credit. We will probably see how that interacts with our bonds. There's really no need for it, but it's nice to go ahead and potentially have that and just leave it as an unfunded uh, line of credit. But as more comes of that, um, we'll see. I've just been putting them off and putting them off until we got the budget and the bonds refinanced. And there's really no hurry to get it done. The trust likes our position, likes what we've done with our expenses, um, and is willing to, uh, to, to come in and, and provide that revolving line of credit if we should need it. So if we, if we did that, what do you think that number would be? Well, we've asked for 25 million. So, and I, I'm pretty sure that's what they're, they put in front of their finance committee, um, but it hasn't been finalized. Probably it'll take us 30 to 60 days, but before we do anything, I'll bring it back to the finance committee for y'all's approval. Any questions? So without, without the 30 million showing, so if the bottom fell out, we have about 130 days. Yes. Cash on hand. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Sir. Do we need to make a motion? Yeah, make a motion to approve. We'll make a motion to approve the report. Second. Have a motion, second. Any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next item is 
Consider approval of Scorpion website agreement, Tanya. Thank you, David, committee. Um, so today I'm here to ask for funding for Scorpion Healthcare to help us do an overall on our website. So currently we have multiple sites that need to be merged into one. Um, and as we're moving more into a digital um, marketing world, um, this is a necessary investment, I feel like, for our SEO. And SEO is our search engine optimization. And really all that means is it's the increasing of the quality and quantity of people that we're having um, come to our website and um, through our search engine results. So Scorpion will also help with that as well. Um, this will be a four month development and implementation plan. And um, currently, Scorpion um, has helped more than 300 hospitals and health systems um, redo their websites and including our five star friend neighbors over in Abilene. So um, we've been reviewing their site this week. Um, also, this is a three year contract and um, once the website goes live, it will just be the $86,000 initial charge. And then once the website launches and goes live, it will be 5,000 a month for maintenance. And they actually do a complete website refresh every years as well. So please let me know if you have any questions. Any questions? Again, a decrease from what we're currently paying. Remember how much the uh, like fifty, sixty thousand dollars less. Less. Okay. We have a motion for approval? I'll make a motion to approve it. Have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, motion carries. Next item is consider approval of the Vinci XI robot leasing agreement. Okay, uh, if you'll recall last month, I uh, briefly mentioned that uh, we were considering um, leasing an another uh, Da Vinci robot. Uh, we've worked with several of our uh, surgeons that would uh, potentially use this. Uh, we've worked with uh, Intuitive, which is the uh, the company that sells that, they put very favorable uh, financing terms in front of us as a way of helping us over, overall reduce our expenses and relates to surgical volumes. Uh, uh, I'm confident that we can put this other robot in and replace the old robot that's almost 10 years old and uses a different set of instruments. Um, to actually increase the overall volume with uh, not only general surgery and the OBGYNs, but with the urologists. So um, uh, after working with them, I put forth to the board that um, uh, we should go ahead and, and move forward with financing a second robot uh, at this point. So both will be used? Both will be used. At this point, um, typically you'll, you'll consider uh, one robot at full capacity when they're about 400 to 425 annual surgeries. Uh, last month, uh, even with our lower than uh, last year's surgery volumes, the robot was one of the uh, items that was busiest. And if you just use the volume that we did in the month of September, and annualize it, we're already at 500. So um, most of the physicians, about 95% of them are using the newer robot. The older robot is, they've, they've all moved basically away from it. So by putting the second robot into play, uh, the intent is to have two rooms running at the same time, as opposed to one in which they're flipping back and forth. So we should see an increase in in volume. Um, I will tell you that honestly, the, uh, the cost for most of these robotic surgeries uh, are going to be at or maybe slightly more on an instrument expense basis than doing it laparoscopically. Um, but the benefit is for our patients. They, they heal quicker and they're able to get out of the hospital quicker. 
It is just the federal overall patient experience. And on certain procedures, it could be days difference um, uh, from the old way or the more most current way of doing it versus robotically. So uh, this is more of a patient quality and patient satisfaction acquisition as opposed to um, tr truly trying to save money. Um, it does help us as far as getting more volume, but to say we're going to save money on a per click basis for every surgery, it's probably a push, but we save money in, in other areas. How much is it going to be? Uh, these typically run 2.2 to 2.3 million dollars all in, and I believe I have on this 2.4, which will include um, some additional instruments to get us started. And it's a lease. It is, a, well, at this point, what they've done on the financing, they've given us the option to either purchase it outright a year from now or start lease to purchase payments a year from now. So we get full utilization for a year with no payments, no interest cost, nothing. So that's a huge win for us uh, financially. When you bill, when you bill on a robotic surgery, does it bill a separate fee? It, it bills with different codes, and there are certain procedures that you you will get a little bit more reimbursement. Okay. Um, but again, it helps, but it isn't the deciding factor. No, I get that. Yeah. Any other questions? Have a motion for approval? I'll make a motion to approve the lease agreement. We have a second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item is the COVID 19 partnership with Odessa College in the city of Odessa. So we wanted to give you a brief update on our COVID partnerships. We have a couple of them going on. And you're probably wondering why is it in finance, um, but it does have an impact on our finances. Um, so we wanted to make sure to bring that in here so you can completely hear what we're trying to do for COVID. Um, Partnerships that we began working on not too long ago with Odessa College. We probably, um, or you probably just now saw that partnership come out online. I know that we sent it to you guys for media because we just now did a full rollout now that their um, school is completely back into session. We kind of had some soft rollouts and then with them last week and the week before opening up for more students, we went ahead and rolled that to the community. So what this is, is, we kind of brainstormed, Russell and I were talking about how we could really help the organizations around our community control COVID. Um, you know, many of our campuses have students on them um, and or that come to them and their parents don't live here. And so what, the, what sparked the idea was to say, everyone needs a mom. And so could we use a service similar to what we have inpatient to guide people to the care that they need and get them to the resources, which kind of helps on the financials. So we started talking about ways to push business into the urgent cares and into our pro care clinic with the hope of growing the program even more so past COVID. So basically what this program is with Odessa College is a 24-7 nurse navigation service. We have a, a call number, so in the middle of the night if I start running a fever or I just don't feel well, um, even if it's in the middle of the day, I can call this person and they can kind of guide and direct me as to what services that I might need, ask questions regarding a nursing care, send them to a CVS, tell them to get Motrin, all of those kinds of things. And then let's say if it's in the middle of the night, then what we tell them is in the morning a nurse is going to follow up with you. 
and we're gonna make sure that you're feeling okay and that you don't need to go to a doctor or somewhere. Um, if they do need to go to a doctor in the middle of the night, of course, we send them to the emergency room. Um, so this really has allowed us to work with Odessa College and be a direct resource for their students as well as their faculty to guide them to the right places to get quick service. Uh, we discounted some fracking agreements for Odessa College so that when they come to us, they kind of have a um, first in line, first appointment type of thing. And then we also have the feel good side where the nurse is calling every day if they have a, a student or a teacher or faculty <coughs> that is uh, COVID positive who call them every day for the 14 days to make sure they're progressing the way that we hope for them to. Um, and if they have other issues that start to come up, maybe their blood pressure or diabetes, our hope with this is to direct them to pro care providers for those other conditions. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we just at least started small, show them that we're here for them as a resource in the community, and then hopefully grow this program to drive some pro care business. So just two of the advertisements that you're gonna be seeing around town. Um, the one on the left that says a call away from feeling at home is the one that Medical Center has created. And then of course the one on the right is what Odessa College has created. Um, so we're really marketing this out to the students as well as to their faculty. All of the faculty at Odessa College are Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so that's really helping us drive some productive business into the clinic. Any questions about OC and kind of what we're doing with them? Is it live now? It is live. Um, and we um, average a handful of calls every day um, from them. We have a great relationship with them. They were very open to this. In fact, um, Dr. Williams wants to write a paper over how this is bringing care coordination into the community um, with our local sure. hospital to impact overall disease management. I haven't seen the ads though. Are we, are we putting them on social media too? No, honestly, right now, those are going directly to their students. And so we're not really publicizing that because we don't want confusion to the community because it's only for oh, okay. the OC students. Okay. And we did kind of talk about that. We talked about putting in the chamber blaster and then we thought, well, wait a minute. We don't want yeah. them to start using the service when we really kind of designed it for other for the students and faculty. If we ever get to a point where we grow the program, I think that that's always an option. What about at UT? So UT um, actually partnered with ORMC. Um, we did talk to them and we presented this program to them. Um, and they had in turn talked to ORMC and ORMC promised them the same thing that we were promising. I don't know how it's going and I don't know if it ever came to fruition because they don't have a care coordination service already in house and we did. So we just kind of expedited and took what we do inpatient to an outpatient service. So I really don't know how it's going over there or if it even came to fruition. It would be worth a follow up. I can do that. To find out. And then I can message the group about what they're yeah. doing over there. Yeah. Um, we agreed on our side to take on all the expenses um, until we reevaluate December, January after the semester to see if people are really utilizing it. So we're using our current staff in the pro care clinic. Um, and then we'll move from there to see if we need to hire anybody or move forward. And at that point, we'll take agreement to go to the college and make a formal partnership um, if we that that's what we need to do. Cool. Yeah. I think this is a large opportunity. Um, you guys all know that we present our needs assessment uh, for the community health. This is one step in getting us out into the community and partnering with people to make a difference. One of the reasons that it's going to be very good for us. Our next partnership is the city of Odessa, which you guys are hearing about. Uh, this is the free COVID testing and the free flu shots for the community. We went live with this on Sunday. Um, so the city council brought a, an approval for a million dollars. That's 750 for us, 250 for Odessa Regional to partner together to bring this between November 1st and December 31st to use up their CARES grant. 
Uh, we're using both of our locations. Um, I listed the two main locations up here for 42nd and West Urgent Care, but we also have GBS, JBS, where you can drive up and get tested there. So in essence, we have three locations for this testing for the community. Um, our hours are Monday through Friday, 9 to 8.30, and Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 5.30. Um, I know Odessa Regional is using one clinic that's located here downtown, and they're open like 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. So Medical Center is covering the bulk of this partnership with the city. Um, we have secured four additional Saturday events um, across the town. We're going to do November the 14th out at Rattler. November the 21st at Health and Wellness in a parking lot to kind of just do drive up testing. And then um, we're going to do two more December the 5th and the 19th, one at our Hetzler location and one out west. We're trying to determine if we want it a little past West County or even way further past the West Urgent Care Clinic. So we're still working through some of those um, calls made out to one of the council members at the church out there. Um, so we're talking through those two additional, but that'll give us four uh, more opportunities on a Saturday for those people to come get tested. Today, as of 4 o'clock today, we have tested 242 and given out that many flu shots as well. So I think that a lot of people are starting to go to those clinics knowing that they don't have to wait on the one Saturday every two weeks. Now, anything else, Yeah, the, we have a contract drawn up with the city. We sent it over today. Uh, they called us back and said, look, there's a lot of reporting that was going to be required out of both parties. They want to know if we were just interested, if they could form that $750,000 as a grant, so they could just send over a check and we just run it until it runs out. And the answer is yes. You know, send it over and let's get it done. Uh, there is a possibility that should we exhaust the $750,000, we can go back and get approval for more. Um, and as the Pace is about what we expected. Uh, the advertising and the word is getting out that uh, you can just walk in and get a COVID test and a flu shot. So we can do that. Uh, we anticipate that number to continue to grow. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's a good partnership. They, they want to spend the money, they don't want to spend it back. So uh, sure. we said, let's take it. Let's do it. Great. So we're getting reimbursed $150 for every COVID test, $50 for every flu How many COVID tests can I have in a row? Then? <laughs> West Urgent Care. Are you talking about the way, way west? Far I west. thought that was close. Mm -hmm. So we're using that parking lot for drive Just the parking lot. Yes. Yeah, so okay. that they can come through. They park in a parking space just like they do on JBS, okay. and then the team comes out, swabs them, and then they go back in. We're, we're trying to make this as simple as we it, can. It, it, when you think you're about to fall out at the end of the world, just drive a little further. <laughs> University in 1936. No, it's going to be passed. No, it's not passed. It's okay. at the loop, so if you just loop, keep on yeah. driving. Well, I know. So you're talking about the one on 1936. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So the, our clinic in the West Walmart is closed up. Yeah. yeah completely. Yeah. I saw that. Any other question? Motion for approval. I make the motion. Second. Got a motion second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, ma'am. The last item is still up here. Signature request is a consent approval of emergency department Belmont Rapid Infusion. So we have five Belmont Rapid Infusers, and what that is is a way to rapidly infuse patients that are needing blood, so your massive blood transfusions, and you get that quickly. We have five in our organization. Um, many of those were purchased before 2012, and so they're now end of life, end of service. Um, one in particular down in the ER, um, we cannot get support for things such as battery power. Um, when you unplug the device, it should last about 30 minutes. This one is just so far past that it's only lasting 15 to 20. Um, and if you're running to radiology real quick, those kind of things put your patients in jeopardy. So I'm asking for the approval to purchase one at this point in time uh, for $28,260. Uh, that does include a $1,000 trade-in allowance, so we got a little bit back for turning in our old device. 
this will remain in the ER alongside the other one. And then we'll work with Stephen Beaver Capital to replace the others that were out of date. Move it. I'll make a motion to approve it. We have a motion to hear second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carried. Well, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It's, it's I mean, the 87th time we already work 4.30 to catch mm -hmm. okay.